We want to welcome each one of you to worship today here in the Village Church. We're so glad to be together. I know we have visitors from out of town. Some have been traveling. I know in our Sabbath school class we had some folk from out of town, and it's good to meet people, learn their names, and then you become friends. We want to welcome each one here today to worship, and also we want to welcome those watching through media. Today our service is featuring the renowned recording group Handpicked. And if you're not familiar with them, uh, maybe, you know, being out of town or whatever, these musicians are all related together. They're members of the same family. <clears throat> and. Uh, all the musical talent just went right to them. And uh, they're so gifted, and we appreciate their sharing with us through the service this morning. Their, their name, handpicked, uh, means something. You know, each of them feels that God has handpicked them for this ministry. But there's also a lot of picking going on, too. So that fits. Well, thank you and them. We've all been picked, haven't we? We've all been picked by Him. Amen. And uh, thank you for uplifting that thought. Thank you so much. Well, we're going to sing now our opening hymn, Rock of Ages, and Handpicked will lead us as we sing. to invite those of you who are able to kneel as we pray together.
Our Heavenly Father, what a privilege to be able to come together this morning and worship you. Uh, we thank you that Jesus came and made it possible for us to come boldly before your throne. And we praise you for your many blessings. We ask that you will be in our hearts today and that our worship, our songs, our prayers, our offerings, whatever is involved in this service will bring joy to your heart. I want to pray for each person here. I know we, we all have individual needs. Some are having medical challenges and need healing. Pray your, your blessing and your care that you'll be close to them in those situations. There are some that are sad and have lost loved ones, various things. Pray that you'll comfort them. And many other needs that uh, I don't know about, but you do. And be close to each one. We pray for the, not only the ones that are here in this room, but also those that are worshiping with us via the television or the internet. And pray that you'll be close with each of them today too. Pray for Pastor Dan as he brings the message this morning. And please open our hearts to be receptive to the things you want to teach us. We look forward to the day when we can spend eternity with you in your kingdom and pray that can be soon. We ask in Jesus' name.
when I get home to that good land, I want to shout in salvation story in concert with the love wash band. I'm going there. Time now, <clears throat> time now to invite the boys and girls to gather the children's offering. And uh, all those funds that are collected go to support activities and events that nurture ministry for our kids. So go ahead, go ahead, boys and girls. And then uh, we'd ask that when you come up front, we ask that you sit right down here on this side. So can you hear all the girls and boys? Just sit right up here on this side. And while you're coming up, we're going to take a few moments here for a ministry focus. And today we're featuring our Pathfinder ministry. Steve Meharry has given a good share of his adult life to Pathfinders, a renowned uh, Pathfinder director. And uh, it's time again for Pathfinders to be starting up this fall already. So Steve, we'll just let you have the microphone and just share with us about registration and maybe some activities, whatever. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Yes, registration is this Wednesday at 6.30 to 8 at the Youth Center on 8th and Bade Street in College Place. This year we're looking for some exciting times because next year at this time we have the International Campery at Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where there will be between 40 and 50,000 Pathfinders from around the world. And so we're excitedly getting ready for that. In fact, we've been raising funds for the last five years for that. Also, this fall in September, we have our Upper Columbia Conference Pathfinder Camporee, which is gonna be held at Camp Fife on Chinook Pass. It is a Boy Scout camp. It's a very beautiful area, and we're hoping that it won't be on fire at that time. Uh, the ages of Pathfinders is eight and up, and we'd love to have everybody that's 10 years old and up come join us. Thank you so much. Thank you. The Pathfinder Club that we have here under the direction of Steve Meharry and his team is just an outstanding club, and uh, so keep all those things in mind, and thank you for your attention today. Well, good. good morning, boys and girls. We're delighted to have you here with those smiling faces. I want you to meet Ruthie, the red-headed woodpecker. Ruthie, tell us how you are different than other birds. Well, one of the big differences is that I love to peck holes in trees, which other birds don't do. Ruthie, why do you pick holes into trees? Oh, I just love to dig out all those bugs and grubs that are underneath the bark that would otherwise disease the tree, and I just love to eat them. Oh, your creator made you very helpful, for you have many safe 
many trees from dying. Oh, I'm just happy to do what my creator designed me to do. I usually start at the bottom of the tree, and I just keep pecking and pecking all the way around the tree until I get up to the top, where there are no more bugs to kill the tree. Ruthie, how can you walk straight up a tree without falling backwards? Well, my creator gave me four toes. Other birds only have three. So I have two that are in front, to pull up in front, and two toes on the back. And those back toes have very sharp claws in them, so I can just kind of dig them into the tree, and it kind of keeps me from bracing myself so I don't fall backwards off the tree. Is that all that keeps you from falling backwards? Oh, no, I have something else, almost like a third leg. My tail, my tail has stiff feathers with sharp things in them, too. So when I've got those two back feet pointed into the tree, my tail is like a third leg, and that really helps to support me so I don't lose my balance, especially when my head's going really fast like this. Well, Ruthie, how do you know that there are grubs or worms under the bark of the tree. You cannot see them. No, but I can hear them. <laughs> hear them? Uh -huh. That's unusual. No, you have good ears, evidently. Oh, the, he, my designer gave me very good ears, and here is how it happens. When I'm ready to find worms, I go and tap, 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 tap real fast for a while, and then I'm quiet. Why are you quiet? Because when that worm or grub hears me tapping the tree, he knows his life is in danger, and he's trying to wiggle and get out of there as fast as he could, so he tr tries to turn around, and my sensitive ears can hear him moving under that bark. And I just keep going my motor really fast, and I go peck, 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 and yum, yum, pretty soon I have my meal. Wow, Ruthie. How fast does your bill travel when you're up in that tree? Well, faster than I can tap my finger or you can tap your finger. I can make 23 pecks in a second. So you oh. try to tap your knee right now while I, while I snap my finger. That's one second. Get ready, start. Oh, you only got about three in there. A woodpecker can get 23. So now I want you to count to three. And would you believe, count to three with me, ready? One, One, two, three. Oh, I only got about 10 or 15 also. A woodpecker can get 69 pecks by the time you count to three. That's like my bill is going 100 miles an hour. But Ruthie, we as humans pound our head that hard, you would have a terrible headache. In fact, your brain would be mush. How come yours isn't? Much? No problem, no problem. Again, my, my wonderful creator designed me so that my skull bone is, you have a hard, when you hit your head, it's pretty hard, isn't it? But my skull bone's kind of soft, and then my creator left a little air pocket between my brain and that skull so that when I'm pecking like that, it doesn't hurt. He just thought of everything. But Ruthie, you do, how do you keep the wood chips from flying into your eyes when you peck so fast? Oh, that is a problem, but again, my creator made it so that I'm a good blinker. So every time I poke into that tree as fast as I can, I just blink, 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 so no chips ever go into my eyes. Wow, that is marvelous what your creator does for you. Can you tell us some more? Well, I don't even have to sharpen my beak because, again, he does, my creator designed me so that at night, my, be my beak just self-sharpens so every morning it's fresh and new. <laughs> Boys and girls, the creator who did all these things for this wonderful red-winged blackbird, red <laughs> red-headed woodpecker, didn't just happen by accident. There's Amen. a lot of people in the world that think it took millions of years for the, for the bird or for any of us to get to where we are, but we know that the Bible says 
in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then it goes through the stages of what he created each day. And do you know, he made, saved the best for last because you were the last thing he created. He made it you in his image because you are so special to him. He has planned for you to be his forever family. Did you know that? Amen. So he's planned you, and he did everything within you. It didn't take a million years. It just took the marvelous creator's wonderful design to make you a beautiful child of God. Let's pray and thank him right now. Father, how awesome it is to see your marvelous creation, how you planned everything just right. Amen. And when you made man and woman, boys and girls, babies, you make them just right. And we're so anxious for you to come and take us with you to be your forever friends and family, your children, to live in those beautiful homes you're preparing for us. Amen. Amen. You can go back to your chairs. Our scripture reading is taken from Luke 15, 20, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. How deep the Father's love for us beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as who which mar the chosen one, bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders, ashamed I hear. Why should I 
gain from his reward. I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my Thank you. I can't think of a better song to prepare us for the morning's message as we explore just how deep the Father's love is. I invite you to bow your heads together with me as we pray. And, and by the way, there was no advance discussion about the sermon. It's just that somehow the Holy Spirit seems to lead out and you can call it coincidence, you can call it providence, you may call it whatever you wish, but that song is just the perfect setup for what we're going to study today. Let's bow our heads together as we pray. Father in heaven, we cannot understand the depths of your love. We are sinners. We have separated ourselves. We have gone our own direction. And yet, smelly, filthy, we come to you. And you run to embrace us. We cannot understand, not fully comprehend your love. But we are eternally grateful. Bless now, as we enter the study of your word. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The title for our sermon today is Distance Running. We're going to be talking about running and the greatest runner of all time. Distance running is really close to my heart. When I was in high school, I was a distance runner. I wasn't fast enough to be a sprinter, so the coach made me a distance runner. And I am forever grateful because throughout my life, distance running has played an important role and a prominent part Many of you know that for the last 16 or so years, I've been a coach at Walla Walla Valley Academy and at College Place High School, coaching track and field, all the different sports. But the one closest to my heart is the one that I participated in in high school. And both at College Place and at Walla Walla Valley, I've had the opportunity of coaching some outstanding distance runners, state champions and those who were nearly there. I had the thrill of my life this past year. Actually, this past spring, this year, when one of my runners qualified for the state championships in the 1600 meter, roughly the equivalent of the mile, which was the race that was my featured race in high school. And we spoke about the race and how to run it. We talked about strategy. Um, I said, there's a very fast runner that's going to win this race. His name is Austin Apperson. He hasn't lost all year long. And I said, I don't want you to burn yourself out by chasing him. But there are about five runners whose times indicate each one of you will have a chance for second place. And I want you to stay with that pack, with that group. Now, I usually don't try to throw out discouragements like that, uh, but I try to be realistic. I remember when I was in high school, in my probably best race of the year, which I, which I was leading at the halfway point, I just heard my coaches at the sideline commenting about 
how fast I had gone out and they were doubting whether or not I could hold that pace for the rest of the event. And sure enough, I fell back to fourth place by the time we got to the finish line. So I, I try not to do that, but I, I broke my own rule and I told Justin that we were uh, probably competing for second place. Don't burn yourself out chasing Austin. Well, after the first lap, predictably, there were about eight runners toward the front of the pack. By the second lap, a few more had dropped back. But much to my surprise, by the fourth and final lap, there were only two runners at the front. Austin Apperson, the prohibitive favorite, and Justin. And they battled down the back stretch. And when they got within 200 meters of the finish line, the unthinkable took place. Justin passed Austin coming into the final turn. Now, Austin did what good distance runners do. And that is, when they got back, Within 100 meters of the finish line, he found the strength and the stamina to pass Justin back and was able to finish a second or two ahead of him at the finish line. Proud just the same of both these fine young men who are dedicated distance runners. What does it take to win? What does it take to make the championships in distance running. It takes strength. It takes stamina. But how do you get there? That's the real question. And the answer is persistence. Running mile after mile after mile to establish that aerobic base without which you cannot be a successful distance runner. Now, these are principles that are alluded to in Scripture. And I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now, you'll notice today that we're not going to have any uh, Bible verses up on the screen. I struggled with that this week. I thought Sabbath morning should be a preparation for the week to train people to study their Bibles on a regular basis. And even though I'll probably have slides up here another time, I thought I'm not going to do it this time because we're making it too easy for people. They don't have to look in their own Bibles to see if what we're saying is true or not. They're just looking at the screen. Now, I will help you out. I will tell you, if you're using the Pew Bible, the page number where we're going to start reading. And I presume if you have your own Bible, well, you're probably well-versed in the Bible and you'll know where to find the passages anyway. So for this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with verse 24, we will begin reading on page 993 of your pew Bible. And I hope you'll do this, do this throughout the week, that you'll open the Bible and read its pages. Or if you have an electronic Bible, you'll... Uh, you know, do this on the screen so you can read. Um, I'm sure you don't go home and lie down in bed at night and look up at the ceiling and have the verses projected up there. I'm, I'm assuming that's true. So we're not going to do it here today. So you can practice using your Bible, which you're going to do throughout the week until next Sabbath. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Paul is writing to his friends in the city of Corinth and is using, as he does in other places, an illustration from the world of athletics. And this is what he says in illustrating a spiritual truth. Remember that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. You also must run in such a way that you will win. All athletes practice strict self-control. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. I'm not like a boxer who misses his punches. 
I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. It takes persistent discipline in order to be a successful distance runner. You have to run long. There is no substitute. We do sprint drills, even with our distance runners in training. But that is no substitute for those miles after miles after miles that are put in in order to prepare for competition and for success. Now, persistence is number one. Number two is confidence. And I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to James chapter 5. We're going to read verses 17 and 18. That's 1047 in your pew Bible. 1047. And what, this is what James writes to us. He said, Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for the next three and a half years. Then he prayed for rain, and down it poured. The grass turned green, the crops began to grow again. Elijah was a man of confidence. He's standing on Mount Carmel with 400 opposing priests who have knives in their hands. Now, if that isn't confidence in God, I don't know what is. Yes, they were turning them on themselves, but what would have happened if fire hadn't come down from God? I think those knives would have been chasing Elijah. So he is here confident that his prayers are being heard and being answered. He is confident. He is full of trust in God. And for runners... They have to be confident. They have to know that they can accomplish the task ahead of them. And finally, the third characteristic is that good runners, good distance runners, keep their eyes on the goal. So I invite you to turn with me to the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, where we will read the first three verses. And this is on page 1043 of your Pew Bible. 1043, Hebrews chapter 12, first three verses. And again, the writer, whom I believe is Paul, is using an illustration from the Olympic contest of his time, the running contest of his time. And he writes, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, now the allusion is to the great stadiums that were built in that time for running events. And so there's people all through the stands, and he's saying, spiritually speaking, we are in front of a great group of witnesses, a great crowd of witnesses to the faith, to the life of faith. And let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from start to finish. Keeping eyes on Jesus. He was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterward. Now he is seated in the highest place, a highest honor beside God's throne in heaven. You see, when the athletes would race in the ancient competitions, when they won, they would be elevated to a place of prominence in the stands with the judges. He was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterward. And now he is seated in the place of highest honor beside God's throne in heaven. Think about all he endured when sinful people did such terrible things to him so that they don't become weary and give up. Don't become weary and give up. That's the greatest temptation of a distance runner. 
A sprinter, he runs 100 meters, it's over. 100 meters is hardly the beginning for a distance runner. You have to get over those side aches and those leg cramps and all the other things that come up in a race. When I used to run in high school, we had a little kind of smug group of distance runners that w we looked kind of down at the sprinters. After all, they just had to run 100 meters or maybe 200 meters. Well, well back then it was 100 yards or 220 yards. I am that old. Uh, but we had to run a mile, two miles. Their entire practice distance was our warm-up distance or less. Warm-up was what we did before we practiced. So distance runners have these three characteristics. They're persistent. They're persistent in discipline. They're confident. And finally, they keep their eyes on the goal. And now I want to introduce you to the greatest distance runner of all time. I'm not talking about Roger Bannister, who passed away earlier this year, the first man in history to run a mile in less than four minutes. I'm not talking about Paul Radcliffe, his British Commonwealth compatriot, who is the record holder for the women's marathon, nor about the two Kenyan runners who have the Olympic record and the world record in the marathon. No, I'm talking about someone we read about in Luke chapter 15. So I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles there, Luke chapter 15 or page 905. And we're going to begin reading with verse 11. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now instead of waiting till you die. In other words, I wish you were dead and I could have my money now, but if you're not going to die, give me my money anyway. How's that for filial love? So his father agreed to divide his family wealth between the sons. A few days later, the younger son packed all his belongings and took a trip to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money on wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him to feed his pigs. The boy became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired men have food enough to spare. Here I am, dying of hunger. I'll go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy being called your son. Please take me on as a hired man. And so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long distance away, notice that, a long distance away, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick! Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we've been fattening in the pen. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. And so the party began. When he was a long way off, he saw him. This father, heart filled with love, an older man, runs to embrace his son, 
that smells like pigs, stinks. The fact that they had to find sandals for him suggests that he was probably barefooted, his feet covered with dust or mud. And the father, who not so many days, months, years, we don't know, before, had been told, I just wish you were dead so I could get my money. Give it to me anyway. Runs a long distance and embraces that son. How deep the Father's love for us. When he was a long way off, if we had been the father, we probably might have criticized. Sad to say, someone came to this church and in this very lobby out here, and they were told to go home. This is a Seventh-day Adventist church, and we don't wear earrings. He was a long way off. And we criticize. He was a long way off, and sometimes we just ridicule or mock. I was at pastor's meetings this past week with other pastors throughout the conference. Our speaker was talking about the many people who once called themselves Seventh-day Adventists who were no longer actively engaged in church. One such person walked away, but years later was convicted by the Spirit of God to come back to church. She walked into the church where she had grown up, where she knew many people. And the person who was welcoming people at the door knew her as well. But there was no warm embrace. There was just a cold, oh, would you like to sign the guest register? Sometimes, when they're a long way off, we just ignore them. We don't do anything. It's not my problem. It's their problem. I didn't do anything to them. Why, not, why do I need to reach out? You know, in our own congregation, we have a thousand members who are not actively engaged with the village church. A thousand. And I know you expect that the pastors should do all these visits. So we have three pastors, not counting our intern who will be gone in a few months. We have three pastors in this congregation. If we each visited 333 and a third people over the next three to four years, before we probably all retire. We could get to all of them, right? 333 and a third people. And they tell us, that is, social scientists say, that our social circles are generally six to ten people. So even if we were able to find those 333 people per person, what is the likelihood that we could be a best friend to 333 people? Not very good, right? And so what are we going to do? If we have the Father's heart of love, what are we going to do? Could we possibly be persistent and not give up? 
Well, I went to knock on their door and they weren't home. Well, I went there, but they weren't very nice. They didn't invite me in. Now, that's just for the few that are willing to go. How many of us are willing to take that first step? You know, the father saw the son a long way off. He didn't hop in his car or get on his motorcycle. Oh, you say, well, they didn't have cars and motorcycles back then. He's a wealthy man. I bet he had a chariot. At the very least, a good horse. He didn't get on his horse. He didn't call for his chariot. He ran right then. And he embraced. Have you ever smelled a pig? My cousin is a pig farmer. He raises hundreds, oh, thousands of pigs. You don't want to get close to his farm. Pigs are nasty, smelly creatures. He says he likes the smell. I guess when you're getting money, it makes a difference. I don't make any money off pigs, I can be honest. They stink! He runs out there and he embraces this son who doubtless still smells like the pigs he's been caring for. Caring for. Father's love. A father's heart. He's persistent. He never gave up. I imagine that he went out there to his front porch and looked down that long road day after day wondering when his son would come home. Wondering until the day that it happened. And then he runs to him the greatest distance that has ever been traversed. You see, the distance between us is so much greater than the distance around the equator. The distance between us is so much greater than a marathon. The distance between us is the greatest distance that has ever traveled. And we have 1,000 in this church alone who are not actively engaged We have a responsibility. Ellen White. I love to study history, church history, biographies. When Ellen White was a young person, by the way, uh, for those who aren't acquainted with her, she was one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we're in the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. And when she was a teenager, in frail health, she was troubled by the spiritual condition of the teenagers that she hung out with. And she determined in her own heart to take Jesus to each one of them. Teenagers. So she prayed. She stayed up at night, gave up her sleep, and she prayed. She prayed for their lost souls, and she would go to them one by one to talk with them about Jesus. And one by one, they began to listen. Their hearts were melted. And then, there were two or three of them who were praying together for all these others until one by one they came to know Jesus as their own Savior. If you haven't read the story, go to our church library. Look for a book called Life Sketches and read the story for yourself. Do we have that heart? How many nights are we, are we staying up in prayer 
for someone who's not here this morning? How many days do we mention that to Jesus? How many times do we take the time to visit? There's a songwriter, his name is Brandon Heath. When my son was walking away from the Lord in his prodigal phase, Brandon had a small part in rerouting him to Christ. He met him at a concert in the Seattle area. And then Positive Life Radio brought Brandon here for a concert on the 4th of July. And I had a chance to meet him and to thank him for the small part that he had played in helping David to get back on track. And he wrote this song. Here are the lyrics. Look down from a broken sky, traced out by the city lights. My world from a mile high, best seat in the house tonight. Touch down on the cold black top, hold on for the sudden stop. Breathe in the familiar shock of confusion and chaos, all those people going somewhere. Why have I never cared? Step out on the busy street, see a girl, and our eyes meet. Does her best to smile at me, to hide what's underneath. There's a man just to her right, black suit and a bright red tie. Too ashamed to tell his wife he's out of work, he's buying time. All those people going somewhere. Why have I never cared? Been there a million times, a couple of million lives. Just moving, passed me by. I never thought I was wrong. But I want a second glance. So give me a second chance to see the way you've seen the people all along. Give me your eyes for just one second. Give me your eyes so I can see Everything that I keep missing, give me your love for humanity. Give me your arms for the brokenhearted. Give me your heart, excuse me, the ones that are too far beyond my reach. Give me your heart for the ones forgotten. Give me your eyes so I can see. Are we running with the Father? To those who want to come home, are we running with him today? We have to run persistently and not give up so easily. Augustine, the famous Christian writer of many centuries ago, was walking out there away from Christ for years and at home. His mother was praying for him day after day after day until his heart was finally broken. He saw his sinful condition and he came home to Jesus. He later reflected, it was not so much that she talked to me about God, but that she talked to God about me. Persistence. I'm here today because I had a persistent mother and father. I remember one day, I was so mad at my father because he wouldn't let me do something that I wanted to do that I stormed out of the house. And when I came back through the living room to go to my bedroom, and there was no other way to get there but through the living room, I saw my father kneeling over a chair and heard him praying for me with tears running down his cheek. And you know what? I know when my parents got up this morning, they prayed for me again. They haven't given up. Dad'll be 97 next month. Mom's a few years behind him. And they're still praying for him. Persistence. Never, ever give up. 
Confidence. Don't throw away your confidence. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 and 36. And I apologize. I didn't write down the page number for this one. So you'll have to find it on your own. But it's not too far from the last verses that we quoted. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 and 36. And here we read this admonition. Don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord no matter what happens. Remember, the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now. So you will continue to do God's will. And then you will receive all that he has promised. We go forward confidently, and then we go forward, eyes on the goal, focused on the goal. Not focused on our pride, I'm thinking about when our, par or when our children walk away. Sometimes we're focused on our pride. The shame that we feel. Oh, people don't think that I'm a good parent because my child's out there in the world. Well, nobody's a perfect parent. And we'd be a lot better off if we would look at the mistakes that we had made rather than trying to whine and say, oh, how did this happen? But we're not focused on our pride, and we're not focused on our pain. Too often times, we're focused on our pain, our loss, when our children walk away. No, we need to stay focused on Jesus, as the writer in Hebrews says. If there's anyone who feels that pain more than we, if, in, if there's anyone who has given more than we, it's Jesus. And focus on Jesus and his ability to win the human heart. Persistence, confidence, focus. Are we running with the Father this morning? Seeing with his eyes, feeling with his heart, touching with his hands. Are we embracing with the Father those lonely, sin-tarnished, outcast, forgotten, pig-smelling hearts that want to come home? Are we embracing with the Father? And are we partying with the Father? Are we celebrating those who have come home? Are we cheering those who are bringing them home? The distance around the equator is small compared with the distance between us. But there is no distance that God cannot bridge and that there is no distance so great that we cannot go with him. The church this morning is looking for distance runners. Will we go the distance? When your home is a campfire and your pillow a stone, when you've lost all direction, your destination's unknown, just cry out to Jesus, he'll send a ladder down. 
When your home is a campfire and your bed is the ground. Jacob wandered in the desert to his father he lied. Though he got his brother's birthright, he wasn't satisfied. Instead of waiting on heaven, he tried to do it alone. Found his home was a campfire and his pillow a stone. When your home is a campfire and your pillow a stone, when you've lost all direction, your destination's unknown. Just cry out to Jesus, you'll send the ladder on down. When your home is a campfire and your bed is the ground. the message and the message is clear wherever we may wander our savior is near when your home is a campfire and your pillow a stone when you've lost all direction your destination's unknown Cry out to Jesus, he'll send the ladder down. When your home is a campfire and your bed is the ground. When your home is a campfire and your bed is the ground. Song. and a good friend of mine. I invite you to bow your heads together with me as we pray. Father in heaven, give us your heart of love, your eyes to see, your arms to embrace. Give us your heart of love. In Jesus' name. Hi, I'm Jeff Kenny, lead pastor at Village Church. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We hope you were encouraged and inspired by today's service. I'm holding one of the cameras we use to bring Village Church service to you each week. It's 16 years old, falling apart, and teetering toward death. Industry standards are changing, and it's past time for Village Church to upgrade their cameras. Would you please help us? Your sacrificial, generous support would help us purchase new equipment so that we could do a better job serving you and reaching others with the life-saving, life-changing good news of Jesus Christ and His soon return. Mark your gift, VCTV cameras, 
and send it to 715 Southeast 12th Street, College Place, Washington, 99324. Thank you.